Guten Abend. First row is a volunteering row. I, I hope you know that. <laughs> I want to talk about avatars. But before I do this, please follow me on a little thought experiment. I brought something with me. This is not a vase. Let's assume this is a vet, something where we can put nutrition in to basically keep organic stuff alive. And let's assume in the near future we would have a technology that allows the following thing. I can take your brain out of your skull. <laughs> which I did in advance. <laughs> brought it here. And the technology allows me to extend the nerve fibers from his body to this brain, to this fat. I put it in here. The thing is, it's still alive. They are still connected. His brain is there. He is there. So this little thought experiment goes like this. So now you look at your brain. Yeah, like, mm, mm, mm. brain, you, brain, you, brain, you. We perfectly know by now that we consider the brain to be the center of our intellect, of our ego, of our cognitive capabilities, basically, of us. We know there is a philosophical direction called dualism, which some of you might know if I, for example, would name René Descartes, who was one of the famous philosophers talking about that. And in this direction, you have a clear separation between body and mind, matter and mind, which is a separation, a trend that is still active in our Western philosoph philosophy until now. And I want to really think about this dualism a bit closer. So you look at your brain. You perfectly know that actually your intellect, everything that you are, is currently processed here. But you see yourself from the third perspective. All of you, just imagine that. I take out your brains. You perfectly know that this is the center of the you. You look at your brains and I ask one simple question. Where are you? Where are you? You're there. <laughs> Most certainly. Who would agree that, these, that you would all have the feeling, if you look at your brain, that you would have the feeling you are in the fat? Who of you would have that? Who would think they are in the body? Who would think they are in the fat? It's roughly one-third to two-thirds. I do these questions once in a while, and you see that this is uh, often the case, that not everybody believes it, but most do. So what I wanted to raise here is, um, why have two-thirds of the people thought about that they are actually still there, although they perfectly know that this is the center of their ego? That is caused by our high dependency between our sensual input and our cognitive system. If you look at this as a whole, you basically, your reality is created by your cognitive system by interpreting all the sensory input you get from the environment constantly as a flow. It comes in, it goes into your sensors. How many senses do we have, by the way? How much? Five? Good, that's good old humanistic. Uh, grown up, it's wrong. <laughs> it's roughly 11 or 12, depending on how we uh, define senses, but uh, concerning to the old Greeks, you are perfectly right, so <laughs> that's okay. We have more than that. And this sensory information, it changes our internal psychophysical state and gives rise to things like sensation and emotion and alike, which then causes us to do actions in the world. 
I'm saying this because I can trick your mind now, besides this little experiment here, by creating artificial stimuli, which might be contradicting, like in this little experiment here. So, so what did happen here? Somebody stroke the real hand of a person in synchrony with stroking a rubber hand. The rubber hand was in the view of the person. So now he has two continuous streams of information which correlate to each other. But the hand which is stroked and which is made of, of rubber is not his. But his mental projection, his mental model, builds this into his body model. And then a threat to this artificial piece is a threat to my real body. And I have the same reactions, shock reactions. Actually, if you take measures, for example, like skin conductance, heart rate and alike, you'll see you have similar increases like you would have in a real shock experiment. So, why did I say that? I mean, you came here for avatars, right? Like the little guy on the left side. Why, why did I talk about, about this? The reason is very simple. Avatars are our chance in the digital world to be replicas of exactly the same type as the rubber hand. We go to the plasticity to what we do. Well, avatars need a lot of technology. For example, the avatar you've just seen on the slide before is created with lots of cameras and you, we are taking the outer hull of the body. That's a lot of processing power. And then we can create lifelike individualized avatars in less than 10 minutes and they look exactly like you do. And then we can take these avatars and we can take these avatars and animate them. We can put you inside of a virtual reality where you look down as your body, but you don't see your body, you see the avatar's body, which might look completely different. We do this, and then you are in the digital realm, and you can do all the motions, all the movements that you would do in reality, but now you're doing this in some kind of matrix, in some kind of fictitious world. And then in these words, we can create mirrors. We can do the same thing in the real world. We have mirrors here. You see this picture is a bit blurry. That's due to the stereoscopy we create so that you really have a mirror impression. And you already see one thing. That's me here. But my mirror image is a female. You know what? It doesn't matter. I accept this as being my body. The reason for this I will um, highlight during this talk a little bit. We call this the psychophysics of virtual bodies. What do we mean by the psychophysics of virtual bodies? There are two effects I want to share with you. One is called the illusion of virtual body ownership. If we meet certain conditions, we accept these digital replicas to be us, as we did accept this rubber hand to be our real hand, meaning a threat to the virtual body would cause a threat I really feel. The stress reactions will be similar. Everything that you do to the virtual body will be equally in quality as to the real body. Don't ask me about quantity. That's a huge area to research. We can discuss it maybe a bit later. If you have created an illusion of virtual body ownership, you are believing this is your body. Then we have a second effect we call the Proteus effect. And this is super interesting. The Proteus effect describes that once we accept this virtual body to be ours, it echoes back to our behavior. So now it's not my body, now this foreign body starts to change me. And this has been studied again and again and again. We have evoked changes of our self-perception, which keep on after you leave this virtual reality. Think about it. You go out to the real world, you've been changed. 
And that has been done, for example, for different body shapes, heights, small people in tall bodies, tall people in small bodies. Very simple, you would say, maybe this is not such a central aspect of your uh, being. This has been done for people which are a bit bulky and people which are a bit thin. You can put one in the other body. And we're currently doing a study against obesitas to uh, basically help people with obesitas, um, showing them, uh, let's say, a corrected body model to help them in therapy. You can do the same thing with age. You can have young people go into older bodies and vice versa. And after this, they have changed their behavior. You can do the same stuff for racial biases. If you put people in a skin of a person or a so-called race that these person have some kind of negative um, attitude towards, after this, these negative attitudes got diminished or even gone. That goes so far that it includes your gender. You could put males in female bodies and you can have females in male bodies. Remember this example with, um, when I showed you me standing in front of this mirror? So this is a typical, a typical experiment we're running over and over again. What happens? Males in our experiments tend to do power posing. So you say like, oh, you're entering a virtual reality now and you know, you're recorded on film and then they go like, okay, power posing, yeah, like this. I'm here, I'm here. So, then this mirror switches on and we show him a female. And the female is doing the same movements he does. So he's standing there like... <laughs> the experiment actually didn't even start. The point is, he has just adopted the role model he has, which he associates with females. So not everybody will do exactly the same reaction. I said, of course, a bit to do with um, how do I think about this other shape I am in now? What kind of attitudes do I have towards this? If you think about all these things, um, what you have to acknowledge here is we have a very, very strong plasticity of self-perception. And then the philosophical trend of the dualism, like here's my body, Here's my brain, they are completely independent. Sorry, that's not true. In our experiences, in empirical work which repeatedly shows the same thing, this is not true. And that gives rise and explanations to many, many, many things we know. For example, people which are injured, for example, they lose a body limp, and they will, uh, co they will be caused maybe into depression or other psychological disorders that they cannot cope with because we have distorted their body model. That's not something that you just swallow down and say like, well, my brain is still intact, everything is good. If you are bound to a wheelchair and you were a, a highly trained athlete, athletic before, that's a real problem for your psychology, that's a real problem for your ego. So, huge thing to think about. What are the causes and conditions? We have basically two directions which cause this. One we call the bottom-up processes. As you could see with a rubber hand, it was important to stroke the hand in synchrony with what they saw. We call this the visuotactile coherence, which is in the other experiment when you are a virtual body and you lift your arm, you want the virtual arm to be lifted in synchrony with that. This is the visuomotor synchrony. Very, very strong triggers. If you meet these triggers, people will accept stick figures. They will accept animals. They will accept every kind of shapes as being their bodies. And things like the, we call, top-down um, aspects for identity, agency, my ability to act in this virtual world, or even a similarity to my real being, are not of that much importance. We work on this, but it's actually not that important to have your avatar looking exactly like you do now. It's not that important. So now you know why I started with this little thought experiment, and I went over to avatars, but it's, like, it's called from avatars to, to latency. Yeah? Where's where the latency coming in here now? Well, think about the visuomotor synchrony. If I break the visuomotor synchrony, this illusion will not come up. Actually, the fact is that the problems here are 
basically rooted in the computer systems we are using nowadays. A look into one of those computer systems we all have either on the desk or on our laps or in our pockets are quite similar. What we find here, these computer systems, and I will spare you the fine details. I just want to point out on the right side, you see this peaks and this red line gives the average latency over time, meaning the time it takes to process from input to output. Think about now we are creating artificial stimulus. We are not the environment, we are not reality, we are creating them artificially. And it turns out that these peaks that we have here, no matter what we do, they are always there. So, some takeaways, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, avatars are quite interesting because they somehow dissolve this clear separation. We thought we had like mind and body, you know what? This is also highly inspired by how computer scientists think about their systems, hardware and software. No, you cannot just use these metaphors and just match them. We are not computers, obviously not. It gives insight into our cognition. We are highly bound to our embodied it. We cannot, the, all these ideas, right? I, in the future, I can take out my brain state. I read it out, I scan it out, and I run it on a computer system. Really? I will see that without a body. I highly object that this will work without causing major major psychological problems with your program running unembodied on some computer system. Evolution has connected our cognitive system directly with our senses. To decouple this is not an easy endeavor. And I could show you various applications, although, I mean, the technology, I'm in VR for 25 years, I have seen it die twice. Now it's there again. We'll see how long this will go. Uh, we are still going to do it for the next 25 years, but that's a different story. Um, I hope I could show you it has still insufficient properties, at least when we think about real-world applications. Maybe not games. It might be good enough for a game. You might think like, well, I have a lag here. I don't like it. I don't buy this again, this game from this vendor. That's not mine. They, they build shitty systems, so I don't do it. But lag in virtual reality is a completely different beast, right? Emma. Yes. Um. <laughs> So this is artificially induced lag. <laughs> and living with this lag is anything, but it's not easy. I thank you. Do you want to have your brain back? Here you go. Thank you.